Welcome back to another episode of Truth Matters. I'm Matthew Shanche here with Mackenzie Drebit, and we're going to be picking up where we left off last time, talking about Dragon Beast, and this episode is about the false prophet. Yes, we ran out of time last time, so we decided we're just going to continue. We cut the episode, and uh, we're just picking up right where we left off at the false prophet in Revelation 16. So if you have any questions on where we are in this whole stream, you may want to go back to the first Church State episode, watch that, and then the last episode we looked at the dragon and the beast from Revelation 16, and we noticed that the Bible tells us exactly who these powers are, and history has shown us through many Protestant writings that we have um, Satan as the dragon and the serpent in Genesis and Revelation, and the beast we've identified in 16 and 13, the first part of 13, as the papacy. Yep, and uh, just to note, the first episode of that is America, the agent of Satan. So that's the first part, and now we're at our third part, uh, talking about the same topic. So let's go into the false prophet, and what we're going to do is just let the Bible tell us all the places where the false prophet is. And we're speaking specifically around this Revelation 16 false prophet, because when you look up the term false prophet in the Bible, you'll see it throughout its pages. But we're zooming in to the end time power that we're looking at here in Revelation 16, which is dragon, beast, false prophet. So we're going to read through quickly all the places where we see the false prophet mentioned and start to extrapolate some details from that. So we're going to start in Revelation 16, 13, and 14, kind of like we did in in previous episodes to give us a baseline, and, and then we'll work from there. Revelation 16, 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's the first place we see the false prophet. The second place we see the false prophet is Revelation 19, verse 20. For the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. That's the second place we see the false prophet. The last place we see is in Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are. So, I think what we need to identify first is that the false prophet is always connected to the beast and or the dragon. It is never on its own when we see it in this final state. It's also identified as the key driver of the mark and the image of the beast. So these major prophetic components of the image and the mark cannot happen without the false prophet participating, and the false prophet is also uh, always part of the beast and dragon. These these entities are always together once we see them in this final threefold state. Yeah, the this is a threefold union. We have the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. They are as one in mind as spirit as God is. They are having the same purpose. They have the same goal and they're ending up unfortunately in the same place which the Bible says, is in the lake of fire. So these are not good guys in the end, but that's where this ties into um, them being a false prophet. Because what is a prophet? It's someone that is professing things that are going to come, but they are also someone that's talking about biblical themes. This is a religious person. This isn't... um, some offside thing or even a pagan thing. This is uh, someone who's professing 
some form of Christianity, but it's a false one. So we have these three places uh, where we see this false prophet in connection to this threefold union. And I think when we start pulling out the, the components of what's in these verses, we see that the false prophet is defined by its deceptive miracles, right? So in, in Revelation 16, 14, it says, for the spirits of devils working miracles. In Revelation 19, 20, it says, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which deceived them that had the mark of the beast. So the, this false prophet and miracles that lead to deceiving people, these all are one and the same. Now, because we only see the false prophet mentioned in these three places, and it does give us some information that it's going to be with Satan and the papacy, as we've identified the dragon and the beast already. So we know this third power, you know, the first two are, um, are powers that have been around for a, a long, long time. Uh, the papacy has been around for almost 2,000 years, and the dragon has been around since, uh, you know, creation, essentially. The beginning. <laughs> yeah, since, since essentially the beginning of, of, of creation, because he was also a created being, right? So uh, that now we can start to f say, where else could we find more information about this false prophet? And the, one of the main connections we want people who are watching this to make is the false prophet of Revelation 16, 19, and 20 is the same as the second beast from Revelation 13. I'm going to say that again. The false prophet from these other places in the Bible, in Revelation, is the same as the second beast from Revelation 13. And we're going to look closely at this. This is a really important point that we need to emphasize and that people need to understand. Because when we're going from Daniel to Revelation, we see all these different powers, we need to be able to realize and understand who is the same, same entity that is talking about. So if we understand and are able to show that this third person or third entity in this threefold union is the same as the second beast in Revelation 13, that changes everything. That changes a lot of things. And that's where a lot of people get mistaken because they don't know who's actually being talked about. But when you know, then you can see a very clear roadmap here. And Revelation 13 gives us this wonderful roadmap. It, it gives us great detail on the dragon's plan, what the beast, the first beast's role is, and what the false prophet's role is. So let's take a look at how we can know that this false prophet is the same as the second beast that we see from Revelation, starting it from Revelation 11. We're going to compare two verses here. The two verses are Revelation 19.20, which is describing the false prophet, and Revelation 13.14, which is describing this second beast. And what you'll notice is, as we have here on the screen, looking at the different descriptive attributes of these two powers. You see in Revelation uh, 20, uh, Revelation 19, 20, that this false prophet deceives by miracles. In Revelation 13, it says, and deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles. You see in Revelation 19, 20 is that the, the beast is there. In the second part of Revelation 13, that he had power to do these things, these false miracles in the sight of the beast. In Revelation 19.20, it talks about the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. It says in Revelation 13 that this power should make an image to the beast uh, that has the wound by the sword and did live. So are these describing the same power? Absolutely, 100%. They have the same purpose and when we're looking at it in the Bible, when we see that something has the same purpose, it's most likely the same thing just rising and showing itself again. So we see that both the false prophet and the second beast from Revelation 13 work by deception. They work by using what look like miracles. They're done at the same time period as like both entities have to exist at the same time because we see in Revelation 19... The beast and the false prophet, 
who wrought miracles before him, that means they both had to exist at the same time. In Revelation 13, it says these miracles are wrought in the sight of the beast. So both kingdoms have to exist simultaneously, right? And they both work to the, the, the power, the false prophet 19 and the second beast of Revelation 13, they both work to create an image and make people worship it. So there's no question that this is describing the same power. So if we want to know about the false prophet, the biggest description of the false prophet is Revelation 13, 11, starting at verse 11 through the end of the chapter. So the whole of Protestantism at one point had clearly identified this first beast as the papacy, showing us that these are real world powers. This is not individuals or corporations or anything to that effect, which obviously didn't even exist at the time that the, the, the words were written. But the papacy existed at the time John wrote these words, right? So we see that these characteristics, as we start pulling them out, they actually could not possibly apply to a single individual, but rather to a kingdom as a whole. So let's dig more into this Revelation 13 record and start to extract what we can about this false prophet and comparing it with the first beast that we see in Revelation 13. So we're going to pick up here at Revelation 13 and starting at verse 11, and then we'll read 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which they had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So we have several symbols here, and we want to break those down, and you're going to see really quickly all the connections that are taking place. Now, I do want to just digress for just a second here on a little bit of a side tangent, and we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but... And the first verse there, which is verse 11, it says, Behold, another beast coming up out of the earth. So we have the earth, and I think we spoke about this before, that the sea represents a populated area, and the earth represents an unpopulated area. Plus it is coming up after this first beast has received its deadly wound. This we don't have time to go into today, but there is a prophecy connected to the first beast or the papacy saying exactly the number of years that the papacy would rule. And that was from 538 AD to 1798 AD when actually France came and gave a deadly wound. They took the Pope captive and he died in prison. And that basically took away the political strength away from the papacy. So they received this wound and that ended in 1798. So now we have a little bit of a hint of when we should see this next beast or this false prophet arising needs to come at 1798. And if Matt, if you want to pick up on some of the rest of those symbols, I just want to digress there, not, not to go on a big tangent, but I thought that's important to point out. No, it will be. It's very important that we look at these attributes because it will tell us, like you pointed out, that it co it's coming up after the first beast already existed and after it re received this deadly wound because one of the jobs of this false prophet is to heal this deadly wound. So part of its role is to get this first beast back into the power that it had before, which was a persecuting church state system. So let's see what characteristics we got from these verses. We see that it had two horns that were lamb-like. 
We saw that it speaks as a dragon. We saw that it has the same power as the first beast. It causes all the earth to worship. It uses deceptive miracles, which gives it power. It will use that power to make an image. And once that image is set up, it will enforce the worship of the image punishable by death. Then it says at the end of all that, then the first beast wound is healed. And then all the world wonders after that first beast. So is there a lot of information describing the false prophet in the Bible? There's a lot of descriptions here explaining all the characteristics of this power. And one thing I wanted to show here is that it has two horns like a lamb. So it has these, you know, Christian principles, which we know a lamb is a representation of Jesus. But it says that it will speak like a dragon. So it has this dichotomy inside that it looks good, but it actually is going to speak like a dragon. And who's the dragon again? We see that Satan. That's the devil. Yeah, which gave its power to the first beast, right? So this is the dragon gave his power to the, the first beast and gave it his seat and great authority. So again, when we pointed out in the last episode, when we're looking at all these things, all the secret societies, all the World Economic Forum agendas, New World Order agenda, this is Satan is behind the main driver behind all of it. So we're just pointing out the mechanisms that the dragon is using to implement this system eventually worldwide. And, and that's really what we want to point at. We don't really have much care for all of the other secret society information. While it's compelling and interesting, we want to know the power behind that so we can look at his plan, what he has planned to deceive the world, so we don't end up wondering after the beast, as it, as it says that all the world will wonder after the beast. So now that we've looked at these descriptions, let's go down and break through some of these characteristics. As, as you pointed out, Mackenzie, two horns that are lamb-like and we not going to dive into all the quotes today just so we can keep moving on the process, but this is civil and religious liberty. So in America at its founding is the only country in the world that promoted this civil and religious liberty. And as I stated in the last uh, two episodes ago now, that that can be boiled down even further to republicanism and Protestantism as the, the founding principles. So the civil liberty was founded on republicanism and the religious liberty was founded on protestantism and these were the secrets of america's power so these are the two lamb-like horns but saying that it speaks like a dragon as you said there was a, a dichotomy between um having these individual rights and liberties as the basis of its government and the basis of its religious freedom but in actuality i want to read a quote here from the great controversy america was also speaking like a dragon towards the beginning of its inception. Now, I just want to interject. When we say republicanism, we're not saying the Republican Party. So I just want to clarify that. That we're not saying, you know, it's Republican or the Democratic Party. We're talking about the structure of America was republicanism. So don't take that out of context. We're not, we're not promoting a party here. Yeah, we don't have much care for you know either, either side of the, the aisle. It's, it's really irrelevant. We're just pointing to the mechanisms again that Satan will use and has used to, to bring about these things and, and what God has allowed to happen in this, in this stream of time. So with this speaking like a dragon, speaking like Satan, let's read this quote. It says, the lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and the practice of the nation thus represented, America. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities, which is interesting because Revelation 16 says out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. And here we see the mouth, the speaking is the legislative and judicial authorities. By such action, it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles, which it has put forth as the foundation of its policy. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast plainly foretells of the development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. So even though America was founded on these principles, 
They spoke, it spoke as the dragon in the repression and slavery uh, issues of early America. And in the end, it will eventually have all the power of the first beast before it. So the third attribute that we see is that the same power of the first beast before it comes into play. Now, we've looked at pretty extensively the, the power that Rome had, the first beast had, was the fact that it had a united church state system. If you have any questions about that, go back a couple episodes and rewatch uh, America, the Direct Agent of Satan, at part one, because we're in part three now. And you'll see that there's no question that the reason that it had all this power and authority to persecute was because it united church and state. So let me ask you, Mackenzie, can the false prophet be an individual if this second beast and the false prophet are the same, and the second beast has all the same power of the first beast before it, which represented, you know, over a thousand years of church state dominance, how could any one individual qualify to have all the power of the the first beast before it? Can an individual hold uh, the power of a thousand years of church state (laughs) persecution in, in their hand? Yeah, you know, one of the main things we have to realize when studying the Bible is... The Bible doesn't focus on individuals so much and focuses on the systems and of the rulership of the entire kingdom because that king who's ruling at the time, really they're just represented of and representing the, the greater kingdom that they are ruling. And that can change. You know, we, you change presidents, you change prime ministers, but the kingdom stays the same. So... When it's talking about this false prophet, it's not talking about a person because there's too big of a time span to be had here. There's too much being affected here. This is not a single individual. This, that would be out of context, actually, from the definition, which is that they represent kingdoms. And this is a, it's a larger entity that is going to affect things because... It also says it's going to affect the whole world eventually, which one person, that's a little bit hard for one person to do. Not even Alexander the Great, you know, accomplished that, that goal uh, in its totality. You know, you have, you have rises of people and people say, well, what about the man of sin? Well, the man of sin represents a seat of one person carried through time. So the seat of the Pope which is switched out by many people, but whoever holds that is the one person, the man of sin, representing the larger system as a whole. So even in the in the instance of the man of sin, we're still looking at the king of a kingdom that as long as there's still the seat of that king, that individual will uh, an individual will fill that spot to, to rule that that kingdom. And so one of the important reasons why we wanted to connect the false prophet to the second beast is because we don't have to guess what a beast is in Bible prophecy. It is absolutely a kingdom. So when we see that it's the second beast in Revelation 13, and it has all the power of the first beast, these are all things that disqualify Obama or the Pope or any individual today as the false prophet, which is, and even the second beast of Revelation 13, as we see a number of individuals make this make this mistake, in, and I'm, I'm sure a total honest mistake, but that's why we want to pull apart what these terms mean and, and how we can piece together the larger picture because there is a very clear picture going on here, but it can get very confusing if we don't let the Bible do what it does and interpret itself. So it has all the power of this first beast. So it's saying the second beast is going to unite church and state and enforce worship principle. This was the hallmark power of the first beast before it. We're not going to get into all the Protestant quotes right now that support that statement. The fourth attribute says it's going to cause the earth to worship. So this statement that the beast with two horns causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall act as an homage back to the papacy. So a lot of people think that we, uh, as Adventists, make big leaps in logic to get to Sunday. But we see that the object of attention, the whole goal of this second beast or false prophet, is to create the conditions where the whole world 
worships something in homage to the first beast, which is the papacy. So no leaps in logic there. This, the whole object of the attention of the first beast, uh, the second beast is to create something that the whole world worships that's in homage to the first beast, which it says once it does this, the deadly wound is healed and all the world wonders after the first beast. So now it's really just understanding what element of worship, what is the, the object of worship that the false prophet's going to focus on, because that, that gives us a little more clarity. Now, when it talks about worship, it may seem like a big leap when we're talking about something like America doing something like this. But it probably doesn't anymore with the amount of things that we've been showing, the leniency to removing the church and state. But it also says, and this is the Bible saying this, that the whole world is going to end up doing this. So this, is, this isn't like, if you could say it this way, little America only. This is the entire world going to follow this same structure. So that seems like almost an impossibility. But obviously the devil has had 6,000 years to perfect his skill. And he is uh, going to execute his masterly devised plan. And that's why we're trying to tell you guys so that you can see the plan behind the scenes, what is going to t happen. And then when it does take place, you can see. So this is where we start to have that transition where we don't see a hundred percent clearly right now, Sunday being enforced as worship, but we're starting to see the things leading towards that. And the rest of the, the um, criteria here actually explain how they're going to do that process and kickstart that into play. Yeah. And we don't want to get before ahead of ourselves. We know that people are going to be like, oh, they're making these leaps to Sunday. We'll get to Sunday down the line, but we're just kind of planting those seeds that the Bible clearly states it's going to be about worship. But then what about it? How does it cause the whole earth to worship? How could you get the whole world behind it? Well, the next descriptive element that we see is that it uses miracles, which give it power. And this is something the whole next episode is going to be about exactly what miracles are coming. Exactly what is the nature? What's the type? What are the, what, what's it going to be that's going to captivate the world's attention? Because when it does these miracles, the next description uh, characteristic, descriptive characteristic that we get is that once it gets this power, because the whole world's enamored by its, its miracle, looking like miracle working power, that it uses this power to make an image of something. Again, back towards homage to the first piece, because it says it's going to make an image that pays homage to the first piece. Okay, so it's going to use these miracles that that wants the whole world to worship, and then it creates something that looks like a copy or something identical to what the first beast had before. And we're not going to get into that now, but these are just this, this, the, the flow of information that we're getting from the Bible. It says, once this image is set up, it will enforce the worship, and it says those, as many as, as would not worship, will be... Killed. Killed. And we touched on that briefly two episodes ago, but that this is no joke. Once it sets up this image and uses these miracles to create this image, well, then it's going to enforce the worship of this image and it's going to enforce it eventually by the punishment of, of death. And once this image is set up, well, then one of the most popular, least understood terms on the internet that I've ever seen, the mark of the beast that they think mm -hmm. that it's going to be a chip or a, some sort of scan or something to that effect. But we see that the mark can only exist, can only even come onto the scene if the false prophet first sets up the image. You can't have the mark without the image being there first. So we're starting to really get details that we can tangibly touch and feel to see uh, who this power might be. So we're going to see miracles. Then they're going to set up this image, this thing that is going to give homage and worship to the papacy. And we have a typology of this in Daniel uh, chapter 3, I believe, with the, the three uh, friends of Daniel, where they set up this golden image and they had to bow down and worship. So they had an image 
and they had to worship. And then if they didn't worship, what was the outcome? They were going to be put to death. And we have that same sequence happening here where this second beast is going to do miracles. It's going to do all these things, set up an image, and you better play along or else could be not too good of an outcome for you. Mm. And so now let's ask a couple of questions. What power came up after the papacy no longer became this world power? Every uh, history book will show you that the era of the persecuting power of the papacy did come to an end. So what two powers, what powers came onto the world scene after this? And yes, you have a bunch of nations nowadays, but but really, what was the power that, that took the papacy out of uh, power? That was France, and then we have America that was rising right at that time, and the only one that was coming from an unpopulated area. So yeah, so there were two primary, yes, there are other nations that kind of came up later on in this world powers on the scene, but the the French Revolution is what led to the, the papacy stopping its ability to, to do what it was doing, or the deadly wound. But then there was another nation, the United States, that also came up as a growing world power in that same time. So when we're trying to discern who this could be talking about, we really only have two options that would qualify for the initial um, phase here, which is who is the world power that rised after the papacy. And naturally people might say France because that was the, the power that actually did the, the pulling of the Pope out of the, out of the seat of power. But we have more descriptions to help us determine which one of these two options could it be. Okay, well, what power had two lamb-like horns? These are horns that are principles which govern uh, the larger group of people on Christian or lamb-like principles. So who yeah. had the two concepts of civil and religious liberty that would fit? Was it France or the United States at this point? Well, I think that France would very much disqualify itself at that point. Because the nation of France at the time, they, the reason that they pulled the Pope out was because they were sick of uh, heavy-handed religious views. They became a secular nation that literally wanted to get rid of the Bible. There were several uh, French um, enlightened people at the time who said, you know, Christianity would be extinguished by some point in the future. So France in no way represented anything uh, lamb-like or Christ-like in the nature of its government. And right at that time, that is when the French Revolution happened. That's where the goddess of reason was taking place. And that's anything but to do with Christianity. So they right there just disqualify themselves from being the right candidate for this position. Absolutely. And even as we go further down this, the timeline of history, who has become the most powerful nation on earth today? Was it France or America? Well, I would say that America is definitely right up there. I would say it's, it's, it's by far compared to France, uh, the global power uh, that has in the world today become pretty much top of the food chain. Now, people could argue semantics on these things, but what we're looking at is it, it was a Protestant Republican nation that no secular person would say, people say it wasn't founded as a Christian nation, and we'll talk about the Freemasons and all these things. We could touch on, on those things later. But the principles of it were founded on Protestant concepts because it, it uplifted the individual rights and liberties, the individual's free conscience to choose how they worship. All those things are uh, Christ-like, lamb-like principles. So by the second question, uh, we can see that the United States is separating themselves from the pack. And now we see that it is today sitting in this position of power. Other people have identified England and Germany and all these other, uh, you know, nations not as America in fulfilling this role, but none of those can match the characteristics that we would see as rising after the papacy, becoming a world power today based on Christian-like principles. 
and then having the tools to create religious uh, conversion to make a worship uh, homage that we were looking at, create something that would be known as an image of the beast. So uh, America seems to fit all the qualifications. And that's, and it also fits the same way it's described in uh, Revelation 19 verse 20 as a false prophet, because it is looking like this lamb-like two-horned uh, Christian entity, but it's actually a false prophet, because at the end it is speaking like a dragon. Yeah, and I've seen you know some comments saying, "Oh, another you know, bashing on America." Oh, you know, I'm American, by the way. <laughs> I grew up in America. I live in Canada now, but uh, I'm I'm American through and through. And it's not my interest to bash a place that has had such wonderful, positive influence for so many people and given them so many opportunities and a, a quality of life. You know, the concept of the middle class is very much in thanks to America in large part because most nations either had the haves or the have-nots. And America created this space in between where you could have a comfortable life, a roof over your head without fear of persecution. So there's many wonderful things about America. It's why the Bible describes it as having two lamb-like principles. There were good things about it, but unfortunately it has the dragon element to it that ultimately ends in it uniting this, this uh, world in some adoration of worship towards the papacy. We haven't looked at that yet, but just extrapolating from what we see in these Revelation 13 verses that we've looked at. So now we're starting to get a, a pretty good idea of who our threefold union is. All of them are powers bigger than any one normal human individual. They're kingdoms in the form of the papacy and uh, the United States, with the other entity being Satan himself, which in the next episode, when we look at the miracles, we're going to look at his role in all this as he plays a very prominent, very visible role in this final deception. Uh, but in order to, again, look at the main driver of who is behind this plan, let's go back and understand what the dragon's looking for in this whole thing. We know the players, we know they're teaming up, we see that the first and second beast or the beast and the false prophet are teaming up to do all this stuff, but what does Satan really want? Let's go back and look at his interaction with Jesus during the, the temptation that he had in the wilderness in Matthew uh, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. So in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, we're going to see the end game for Satan. And we're going to have to keep this rooted in the back of our minds because there's going to be a lot of winds of strange doctrines flying around trying to confuse us because that's what Satan's goal is, is to confuse us and to create the conditions where we can't tell the real from the fake. But if we're rooted in what he wants and we know what he wants and we know his methods and tactics, well, by God's grace, we might be able to help ourselves and help others get through this uh, deception that's coming. So Matthew 4, verse 8, again, the devil taketh him into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he saith, saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou will fall down and worship me. So what does Satan want more than anything? He wants worship. And this is really important to understand is the end goal. Because we have this threefold union, we know what they're doing, but is, like many people talk about the New World Order, all these secret societies, but they don't understand the whole purpose and the point of why everything is going down. It's not just money. It's not just because they have a power trip. It is actually because they're actuated by that dragon, the serpent, Satan, and they actually are searching for, and he's searching for, worship for himself over God. And this is the whole theme throughout the whole Bible. Him saying that God's a liar from the beginning. And going to the end, trying to prove his point that he's the one who actually deserves worship and homage. And that is actually the punchline 
as crazy as that might sound, for the whole New World Order structure is actually the worship of Satan. Yes. And the people who are part of this system, they may be after power and money, but in in the most, you know, uh, short-sighted vision of that, because Satan doesn't care. He's actually not even, he doesn't want just like casual worship either. He's not looking for you to worship him through nature. He's not looking for you to worship him through other things. Here he is standing with Christ. And there's some people that say like Satan doesn't exist as an actual entity as real as you or I. Well, then who's Christ interacting with? Who's asking him direct questions to do these things? Like he's a very real entity. And one of the, I'd say the greatest trick the devil ever pulled for an individual heart and mind is to make you think he didn't exist. He does exist. He interacted with Jesus. Not only did he tell him that he could give him all the kingdoms of the world, but he says, I'll give them all to you. Because some people think his goal is to just take this world, but it, it is in a sense. But the real goal behind even having the kingdoms of this world, his object is just worship. He's like, Jesus, I'll give you the, the things that Adam gave me when he fell, because that's when Satan took uh, authority as king of this world, uh, ruler of the, 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 the earth, so to speak. But he's saying, I'll give you that because I don't even really care about it. What I want is your worship. And so that ultimately sits, as you said, Mackenzie, is the very foundation of everything that all of these systems are, are doing. And what I find really crazy is when you look at all the secret societies, all that you're finding in there are worship systems telling you how to obtain eternal life. Yeah. And he wants, he said in the Bible, we have quotes from Satan. It says, I will be like the most high. I will sit on the place of God. And this is the whole battle, the whole great controversy that's taking place from the beginning of the creation until when we're restored and sin is done away with again, that he should replace Jesus. It is his attack and trying to gain worship that he should actually be in the place that Jesus is sitting. And that's, let's see if that matches up to what the goals of the, the beast and the false prophet are. Right, Because we see that he's got two friends, the beast and the false prophet. Now let's go back to Revelation 13 and kind of mash some of these verses together and see if Satan's goal of worship matches what the roles and objectives are of the beast and the false prophet. Okay, Revelation 13, 12. This is talking about the false prophet. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes them which dwell on the earth to worship the first beast. Okay, now let's look at Revelation 13, 3, which is describing the papacy. It says, And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon. So after the, the deadly, after the false prophet does what it does, sets up the image, and creates the conditions for the mark, then all the world wonders after the first beast, who then does what? Leads everyone to worship the dragon, who gave him his power and seat and great authority. So who's at the head of the table and what is the object of their attention? It's Satan and he wants your worship. And the only reason that the, the papacy and American Protestantism, because uh, we keep saying America, but it's it's the religious aspect of American Protestantism that's, that's going to do all this. Their whole goal is to create the conditions so that you worship a false system. And every aspect of what's going on behind the scenes in the world is working towards this one end goal of a world worship system that is focused on the principles of what the dragon wants and not what God wants. And I want to point out too that this, this word wonders, it keeps it appearing. You see that all the world wondered after the beast in Revelation 13.3. 3. In Revelation 13.13, 13, it says, and he doeth great wonders that he makes miracles come down in the sight of the beast. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, it says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Yeah. So America is going to get the power of the first beast, which is to unite church and state. It does that by means of deceptive miracles, which we're going to get into great detail in in the next episode, which I think is... <laughs> Really yeah. going to shake shake some people up, but it's just the truth. So, brothers and sisters, God gave us this information for a reason. We're supposed to understand this. So, these miracles are going to give it power to unify church and state, 
And then when it does, it creates this image that the whole world uh, gets on. And ultimately, we see this is the essence of the, the one world system that's coming that so many people think we're going to have a one world government and one world religion. But how the heck do we get there? We get there by means of these false miracles. And, and look, God's in control. This is not to uplift and say that Satan has, you know, all this power and means to do these things on his own. The only reason he's allowing all this to happen is so that people will get serious about their relationship with Jesus. They get serious about studying and opening the word, and they get serious about making this the key part of their lives so that they can get through this place. This place is just about survival, unfortunately, to get to the next place where there's no sickness, no death, no disease, no sadness, to a place that goes on forever. Because this place is is falling apart, and we are um, meant to go to our advocate, Jesus Christ, and say, please help me through this. And this is our our attempt by his grace to, to show the pieces of how this whole thing's going to come together. So let's take a quick look at the image of the beast, because now we know that it's about worship and that these, these threefold union is going to work in harmony to create these conditions for this image. But what the heck is this image? Now I'm going to quote a... Uh, a quote from the a book, The Great Controversy. It says, In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Now, I want to go back to that Lauren Boebert <laughs> clip that we watched right at the very beginning. Is this exactly what she said? That the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state would be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. She literally said that with her own words. Yep. There's there's no questioning what she was implying, and that just lines up perfectly exactly what we're reading here. And we have to realize something. This image is connected to the mark, right? So each kind of is going to help us define one other thing. So we have this image that's being set up that is uh, going to determine the mark of the beast. So this image and the mark is one in the same essence. So that gives us a little bit of a, uh, a connection there when looking at the definitions. And I think it's important that we were trying to show like the, the words on the page of the Bible are coming off the page into real life into the narrative. And we're hoping that we're early enough ahead of the, the curve, so to speak, that when this reaches people who don't know these things, as we know there are many who already do, but for those who don't, that they may say, well, no one's talking about church and state to that level. There are no miracles being performed anywhere. The papacy's over there but in, in Europe, but they're not really influencing my life at all. Well, that's all going to change. And the reason it's good to understand this now is so that way when it does change, your head isn't spinning saying, what's happening? Miracles, oh my goodness. And then when we get into what the miracles look like, brothers and sisters, this is gonna be the overmastering delusion that causes, if it were possible, even the very elect, as the, the Bible says, even the very elect to be deceived, if it were possible. But the reason it's not is because they understand this is gonna come before it happens and they have yeah. the tools They're to know. They're looking for it. Yeah, exactly. It's like, how could you know that someone was going to break into your house or they're waiting for you to, to cause you harm at home? But it's like someone coming beforehand and saying, hey, there's someone at your house. They're waiting for you. They're waiting by the back door. And if you go back there, they're going to they're gonna grab you and take you. But because you know this already, you're going to be able to take the police with you and you're going to be able to take that, that threat out because you knew it was going to happen. Now you weren't scared. You were prepared. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here and preparing not only ourselves by doing these things, but help others prepare for these same things. So what's strange about all this is, is kind of where it sits today. I saved this article from maybe a, a three or four weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, where it says that there's been a recent Gallup poll in the United States that says fewer in the U.S. now see the Bible as the literal word of God. A record low 20% of Americans now say the Bible is the literal word of God, down from 24% the last time the question was asked in 2017, and half of what it was at its high points in the early 80s, 84 and uh, 80. Meanwhile, a new high of 29% say the Bible is a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. 
Mackenzie, what, what are fables and legends? Are they real? No, they're not real. And actually, the funny thing is, is that fable and legends come from paganism, which is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Yeah, so people are intermingling fable and legend, which the definition of means essentially not real. So this marks the first time significantly more Americans have viewed the Bible as not divinely inspired than as the literal word of God. The largest percentage, 49%, choose the middle alternative, roughly in line with what previous years are. So we see that it almost seems like the trend is Fewer people are looking at the Bible. Fewer people are taking it in its totality, we'll say sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone, as a true, real, historical record of the history of the world and where it's, where it's been, where it is now, and where it's going. Yet somehow we get this uh, united church-state system in America. So how does America go from a mainly secular nation today to a hardcore Christian religious power that creates an image of the beast. What could the catalyst possibly be? And we've touched on it already many times. Every place the false prophet is mentioned. And the most descriptive part in Revelation 13, the second half of the second beast describing the false prophet, the main attribute of the false prophet is what? The false, and I'm going to use the words false, <laughs> false miracles that they're yes. going to be performing that are just going to awe the people, make them think that, wow, there must be a spiritual realm. There must be these things. Look at all the things that they're happening. They're going to be coming. They're going to be raising the dead. They're going to be, and I'm going to put all of this in quotations, raising the dead. They're going to be healing people. They're going to be, you know, fixing whatever it may be, the climate, you know, uh, places, and doing things that nobody could even dream of happening. And it'll be like an overwhelming flood of information that they don't even know how to deal with. And then they're given this solution, which is go back to God and we can fix all of this. Mm -hmm. and, and let's see if scripture supports that. Revelation 13, 14, and deceives them that dwell on earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do inside of the first beast, saying to them that dwell on earth that they should make an image. So I'm going to read this quote because it, I think it ties some of the scriptures together in showing that it is these miracles that are coming, brothers and sisters, that are going to deceive the whole world. And if you're not ready for it, if you don't know miracles of a miraculous nature are coming, and, and Mackenzie kind of hinted at some of it, but we're going to get into the next episode. What are these miracles? What do they look like? Who are going to be the, um, the expounders of it within Protestantism specifically? So we can start to determine, uh, keep an eye on this power as it moves and shapes and see what happens. So let's see what Great Controversy, page 680, says about this. It says, The papacy received all its power from Satan. We know that's true because it says the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. And the two-horned beast exercises the same power. America ex ex exercises the same power. It also becomes the direct agent of Satan. Hence the name of our episodes. It's from this, this passage here. America, like the papacy, will be the direct agent of Satan. It says further, And its satanic character is further shown in that it enforces the worship of the image of the beast by means of these false, false miracles. miracles. That's right. And then she quotes scripture, He doeth great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men and deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. So, the Bible is painting a very clear picture of our future, and it is a future that yeah. is defined by a religious movement that is spurs an entire world's interest on miracles. Now, to me, that makes a lot of sense within the context of things because I can't see a secular United States um, becoming overwhelmingly Christian in its totality because... Yes, Protestants are a large number of the nation and Catholics who uh, say they're Christian and, and uh, other, other groups that associate with Christian ideals. But to get the entire nation to ask for religious 
laws and unifying church and state. I mean, that just doesn't happen with a Bill of Rights and a Constitution, which is why the papacy hates it so much. And in a, in a further down the line episode, we're going to look at a Jesuit document that that pulls out all the information and why uh, the Constitution and the common good of the papacy cannot coexist. They do not. It's like mixing oil and water. It just doesn't work. But that these powers, brothers and sisters, it's just going to be almost impossible. I would, say, I, would, I would actually say it will be impossible to not be deceived by these things if you don't know about them. It's just because imagine a, a secular world, an atheist, seeing what seems like a legitimate miracle, and not just ones, they're, one, they're happening everywhere. To atheists, seeing is believing. You're going to have people converted instantly by witnessing something with their eyes and thinking with their head and their heart, wow, this must be true. But what does the Bible say? We can't trust our, we can't trust our hearts. We can't trust our senses. We're set up to be deceived. We're in a fallen world. We're fallen beings. We default to the fallen worship system which is serving sin over, over serving God. So it takes a personal relationship with Jesus Christ to understand these things and to have faith that he can work through you to get you ready for these times. And that's why he tells us ahead of time, and that's why we are of the commission in Revelation 14 to give these messages to warn people because God doesn't want anyone to be deceived because of lack of knowledge. He wants them to be able to make the decision because they've seen this is going to take place and the devil is going to try his hardest to cover up things so that people don't see what he's going to do ahead of time. But that's why we're here. That's why we're saying these things so that you can see, hey, there's going to be miracles taking place, but they're not going to be of God. There's going to be these worship laws enforced to try and fix all the problems in America, but... That is not God's plan either because God doesn't force anyone. So we need to be aware and we need to see the traps that are actually put, these snares inside these uh, almost looking like lamb-like principles. Mm -hmm. And we saw the war was between the dragon and the remnant. You're either in, at the end, one of those two camps. There is no in-between And there also is no sitting on the sidelines in this whole thing. It says all the world will be involved. All the world will wander after the beast. And the only way you could be part of the remnant is if you meet the other criteria for the remnant. There are those who keep the commandments of God, have the faith of Jesus, have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. If those things are not part of your regular dialogue within your church and within your life, those attributes, the faith of Jesus, prophecy and God's law, God's commandments, it's going to be impossible to qualify to be part of the remnant group. So this is why we should open the books and and dig as we're looking for buried treasure to understand these components. And if we already understand these things, then these presentations are meant to strengthen your faith, to see that these things are coming to fruition. And um, in the next episode, we're going to cross into, into another level of this to show you guys what type of miracles are coming because it is going to be just uh, incredible, uh, the amount of deception. But God has the power. He is in control, and he is going to give his remnant people power and help to offset this movement as well. So don't be afraid. Uh, Don't get worried. Let the burden be light. Jesus' burden is light. If you're having... uh, internal trouble with this, go to him, ask for guidance of the Holy Spirit, ask for forgiveness. God will not leave you. He is our father and he is a good father. So we're so grateful for that. And Mackenzie, I'm grateful for being able to share this information with you and share this with people. And um, I'm looking forward to doing it again with you here soon. And God gives us the tools to be able to discern these miracles, the false ones from true miracles. So we're not, we're not having to be left here to guess. He gives us all the information we need so that, and we're going to go through some of this in the next episode. Okay, here's the miracle, but how do we know that's not a real miracle? How do we know that this is a false miracle? And we're going to be going through all of these things. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching. 
uh, God bless. Make sure that you are studying yourself, that you're a watchman that rightly is dividing the word of truth. And like, share, and subscribe. We need to get this message to as many people as possible because we want people to not be deceived by these things that are coming so that they can be ready as well. And brothers and sisters, we read your comments down below. So keep them coming. Engage with each other in a respectful, Christ-like manner. Remember, everything we do is on the record books of heaven. So let's conduct ourselves with a Christ-like character and engage in a dialogue that can be edifying for ourselves and for others. We, we're very grateful for your participation and engagement, and, and we're right there with you as we, as we read through those uh, in each video. So thank you guys so much, and God bless.